Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, October 15th, 2021, and I'm excited to welcome Victor Dover, co-founder of Dover Coal and Partners Town Planning, back onto the podcast for an update on his recent activities, including the fact that he and John Massengale are currently working on a second edition to their fabulous book, Street Design, The Secret to Great Cities and Towns. We also discuss why it's so important to start first with the green parts, the parks, trails, and preserves when going about the process of planning. We then talk about the importance of transforming our streets into comfortable, pleasurable, and beautiful places that encourage people to walk, cycle, and linger in these vital public spaces. Part of that transformation must also include creating bike networks similar to those seen throughout the Netherlands and in Copenhagen that are safe and inviting for all ages and abilities. But first, before we dive into those discussions, please allow me a brief moment to say that this episode is once again being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. If you'd also like to help support my efforts by making a contribution, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. It's also important to mention that there are three additional ways that you can help support my efforts. The first is to simply subscribe to the audio podcast on your preferred listening platform. The second is to subscribe to the Active Towns YouTube channel. Just be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll get an alert when I post my new video each week. And the third, please help me to spread the word about the Active Towns initiative and my content by mentioning it to a friend, a colleague, or even someone in your community's leadership that might benefit from this information. Thank you all so very much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's jump right into my conversation with my good friend, Victor Dover. Victor, it is so wonderful to connect with you here once again. Welcome back to the Active Towns podcast. My pleasure. Glad to be here. For those people who may have no clue who Victor Dover is, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and uh, and then we'll dive into getting an update on how things are going. Honestly, John, the only appropriate way to say this is I have the best job in the whole wide world because what I get to do is travel around and work with my brainy colleagues and um, and help communities figure out what they want to be when they grow up. You know, draw pictures of places that don't quite exist yet, that might have been in the making for a long time but have never quite matured, and uh, draw lines on a map and say, what if it's like this? That's what that's really what we do. And so I'm a town planner and an urban designer, and that mean that means also question asker, sometimes troublemaker. That's good stuff. And how did you get into this? I mean, was this like a lifelong passion from the time you were a kid? Well, I went to architecture school and, you know, in architecture school, you learn a lot about individual buildings. And uh, then I, I lived in Old Town, Alexandria, as did uh, my business partner, Joe Cole. And we moved to Miami and we suddenly figured out what Old Town, Alexandria was teaching us about walkable communities because in the 1980s, we moved to Miami. It was an exciting place. It still is, um, but very much built up around the car. And so it suddenly was kind of clear to us that there was more to the built environment than individual buildings. There was all that space between the buildings that we assumed someone else was in charge of, like the way the streets are laid out and the way the, the blocks are made, the way the neighborhood is shaped, where the park is. And, of course, the, that's urbanism. That's the stuff that uh, the urban designers and the town planners figure out most of the time decades before the architects show up so we we learned to think about the architecture community and we fell in with uh, smart teachers and colleagues and mentors and became new urbanists uh, and so our, our practice we started like a lot of 
young designers, mostly illustrating other people's designs, making cool gee whiz before and after pictures on the computer. When that was new, uh, in the years before Photoshop, we we started doing those kind of pictures. And that put us in a lot of interesting rooms where people like the neighborhood leaders and the developers and the mayor and the preservationists and the city attorneys and whomever were trying to figure out what was the right thing to do. And we realized very quickly that we needed to do more than just make the pictures. We needed to advise them on what we'd seen in our travels, what we'd seen their peer communities do. So that's how we became Urban Design Firm. So this is our 34th year in practice uh, doing that kind of work. I get to travel all around. We have a, a great many beloved projects close to home too. And uh, it's some, sometimes we're working on something that gets built that year. Sometimes we're working on the 100 year plan. So um, that, that, that work takes us about half the time to work for local governments and community groups and the other half the time to work for private developers and investors or families or foundations trying to do large-scale land stewardship. But um, you know, we, we end up, in every case, having to serve as translators between these two groups. So we draw a lot of pictures. We, we make illustrations of what if, you know, before and after, um, helping people visualize change before it occurs so they can make better decisions about what kind of change to allow or promote in their town. Yeah, that's it's fascinating too, because you mentioned something there about uh, the space between, and I believe you wrote a book about the space between. Well, co-wrote uh, with my buddy, John Massengale. Uh, together we wrote a big fat book on street design. Uh, it's a really multi-purpose tool, it's about that thick. And you can use it as a doorstop, a hot plate. You can use it to um, to hold something down as a paperweight. But at, but the real reason for it is to is because it has 500 pictures in it, and it was sort of a subversive document. We we went around and gathered up all these pictures and measurements and so on of great streets like like well like Church Street in Charleston, and with the hope that some mayor or city council member or neighborhood leader or developer would go to that meeting with the Department of Transportation or the Department of Public Works and slide the book across the table and point to one of the pictures in the book and say, how come we can't have a street like that one in our town? Uh, and I'll, it's the most gratifying thing in the world. I hear all the time about people who are using it just that way. And there's a little bit of news about the street design book. Uh, okay, yeah, now, go ahead. Uh, Seven years later, uh, John Massengale and I have just been asked to produce a second edition, new, expanded, and updated. Uh, so watch out for that in 2022. Wow, so that's fast <laughs> in 2022. Is it going to underway? Is it going to be a, a, a an entire rewrite, or, or it, it's? It, it seems like if it's 2022, it's going to be you know rather surgical and strategic. It'll be a little of both. Um, there were a great many uh, threads we opened in the book and asked questions about and speculated on that have since come much more sharply into focus in the uh, in the years since. And uh, for example, the, the emerging thinking about bike infrastructure in the city a little more refined now. We've had obviously had the most amazing experience uh, during the COVID pandemic with giving people back their streets that had been surrendered to cars. So we'll expand on that topic as well. And the, uh, the interior of the book will be changed as well because we're going to go back and do revisions on practically every page. The big change will be it will be in soft cover instead of hard cover, so it will be more affordable. And then and uh, it'll be color throughout. And we think that'll make it accessible um, to a lot more people instead of just the, those who have been using it as a textbook. Fantastic! I'm very excited about that. I cherish my copy and uh, and and refer to it frequently. And you, you mentioned a little bit about the the changing dynamic in terms of you know bicycle infrastructure and also the pandemic. And it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, I speak frequently about the fact that in the last five to ten years or so, we really appreciate so much more 
how important all ages and abilities approach to uh, to active mobility uh, infrastructure. I mean, it's it, we knew it then too, but we really appreciate it much more now. So, or at least that's my perspective. What's your what is your thought on that? Well, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, in a time when there's a lot more focus than ever before on diversity, equity, and inclusion, I have to remember that inclusion also means including those who are differently abled. So um, I've, I've always ad advised by my, uh, my good friend Steve Wright, who, who researches and writes a lot about uh, making cities accessible to all, that we should start with, with uh, people who might be a little sight impaired or in a wheelchair or have other uh, issues related to mobility and think about making the city accessible to them. If we do that, we're actually gonna also end up with a city that's better for the people who are aging, the folks who are um, eight years old. Uh, so in a way, everybody benefits from starting that way. And I think that that is, I think it's increasingly evident in our work. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it is. And I noticed that our public agency clients are more aware of it now. They're asking for it before we have to bring it up, which is great. That's fantastic. And Can we, I pause you for just a sec? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's been a whole lot of background noise. Mm -hmm. um, there was, a, I don't know, some teenagers with a really, really loud soundtrack of the city going on right outside my window. They were rattling the windows. Did, yeah. did you get all that? Do you want to do any of that again? <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I think that it, it actually adds to the fact that we're, you know, you're operating in a city. <laughs> well, I am. So, it's the soundtrack of the city, which it's is the fine. Sound, um, it's the soundtrack of the city. And it's the soundtrack of, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming they were rolling by in motor vehicles. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah. I didn't part the curtains to see, but I'm pretty you, sure that's what was happening. A, absolutely. So, that actually brings up another topic, which is, you know, cities are, are not noisy inherently, you know, cars are noisy. And that's one aspect of cars being noisy. I mean, we certainly think of, you know, engine noise, we think of the, the you know, the friction noise of the tires. But yeah, even the thumping music that, you know, rattles your windows of your, your really cool uh, offices there. And it's, it's one of those things, it's one of those topics that when we talk about quality of life and livability and living with less traffic with less you know cars in our city that that powerful impact and 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 noise is is a part of that well two thoughts about that well first of all if you aren't recording a, a, a video blog post or podcast you uh, probably don't worry about it because the soundtrack of the city is kind of a welcome thing. I know a lot of people who are actually kind of glad they live near the railroad tracks because every once in a while in the middle of the night they'll hear a train whistle or whatever and it's just charming and romantic in their minds. Um, so it's not a you know it's a great thing actually. And we feel the presence of other people because we can hear their children laughing or um, or what have you. It, but when the cars are making all the noise, then there's a kind of stress from it. There's an experiment going on uh, right here in downtown South Miami where one of the streets has been changed just recently. They eliminated all the right turns on red, and then they created an all red phase on all four legs of the intersection, uh, like the famous scramble or Barnes dance intersections where you can cross diagonally if you want to because it's an all pedestrian phase. All right, well, during that all red phase, all the motoring has stopped. The cars are kind of backing up a little bit. Um, and I don't know if they'll, the, the experiment will turn out to be something permanent or not. But for that uh, period of time, you know, maybe 60 seconds, while folks are crossing in the crosswalks on foot, the cars are all stopped. And they're idling, but they're idling quietly. And the noise level of the neighborhood just drops dramatically. You can hear a pin drop. It's actually kind of amazing. And it's just a reminder that when our cities were being settled and uh, there was the occasional clip-clop sound of horses' hooves, uh, they were not the noisy places they are now with all of the engine noise and you know the Indianapolis 500 that flies outside every elementary school. And so that's you know just something I can't help noticing. We also, uh, I think it's, 
reinforces my conviction that uh, designing the, the city by starting with the green parts is especially important because you don't just start with the real estate. You, you start with the parks and open space and uh, the preserve areas or the forested slopes or the green tree-lined streets and trails and greenways. And if you do that, then great addresses naturally shake out for the, for the real estate facing and shaping all of these public spaces, the streets included as maybe the most important public space. Um, well, it turns out that the parks and open space and the greenways and trails are one of those places of respite where you can go get a break from that uh, booming soundtrack of the city and have a few moments of peace and quiet. And uh, so we have two, two beautiful trail projects in the works here locally. One of them, which I love, is, is called The Underline, which is a remake of the space under the, metro, the elevated metro rail. And for the most part, it runs parallel to US uh, Route 1, now Harriet Tubman Highway. And uh, there are a lot of cars on that corridor, and there are pretty noisy trains going overhead when the train goes by. Uh, so down below is this exciting and dynamic public space. But man, you know you're in a city because there's a lot of noise and interaction, a lot of bustle, a lot of people coming and going. The other project which connects to the underline is called the Ludlam Trail. And the Ludlam Trail run is a rails to trails project. So it runs on an old rail corridor, a hundred feet wide, uh, through neighborhoods and between schools and parks. And uh, you get a, a hundred or 200 feet off from an intersection and it's utterly silent, just tranquil on the Ludlam Trail, butterflies and birds and bats and what have you. And the, and the experience is completely different and they're both connected to and the part of the network that makes up the East Coast Greenway. And I'm really excited for people that are visiting Miami to experience both trails because they can see the coming and going of the exciting ca caffeinated city on the underline uh, and, you know, surrounded by tall buildings and so on. And then they can get on the Ludlam Trail and in, be in the woods, be in the trees, be, um, be in, the, in peace and quiet. And they're all right there together in the neighborhoods. Starting with the green parts, the big idea. Yeah, yeah. And if memory serves, speaking of the woods, uh, I, I think you all have recently helped uh, Missoula, Montana with, with a plan. Talk a little bit about that. We have. Uh, well, we did a downtown plan for Missoula, which uh, was, is an exciting follow-on to a successful plan they already had. They implemented it with great vigor. And that's what you want in our business as a client that's going to actually use your plan. And we saw from their last plan that they were serious as, as you could get, and they were gonna use this plan. And they went right out and started implementing things in the new Missoula plan uh, after it was completed uh, about a year and a half ago. And then they signed us up to do some follow-on tasks, special areas in detail, uh, road corridors, a plan for the riverfront parks and trails, and a uh, plan for new neighborhoods uh, emerging on the edge of town. And now those all go together in kind of an interlocking set for Missoula, one of the great places in America. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I, I noticed out on your uh, on your website the uh, the parks and trails portion of uh, of that Missoula plan. So I was like, ah, cool. It's exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> you know, Frederick Law Olmsted, um, who contributed so much to the founding of the modern profession of landscape architecture and to great legacies like that we know him for, like the design of Central Park in New York and Prospect Park in, Bro in Brooklyn, for example. Um, you know, he, he was uh, working, practicing, sometimes in faraway places, like just like we have to go far to faraway places. Missoula's kind of far from Miami, but, but we knew we could help make a difference there. And Olmsted, uh, after the success of Prospect Park, was asked to come to Buffalo, New York. This was at the time when Buffalo was at the you know, zenith of its prosperity as the wealthiest city in America. And they were, they were implementing the idea of, uh, of a late 19th, early 20th century um, beautifully. And 
they uh, they came to Olmstead and they said, well, we've got several sites picked out and we want you to design our prospect park. Pick uh, pick our, you know, pick which of these sites should be our prospect park and, uh, and advise us about which one. And Olmstead's reply was, you should do them all. They should all be parks. And you should also design great parkways and greenways uh, and an interconnected uh, park system to integrate them, to connect them to one another. He was absolutely right. He did that. And that's how Buffalo earned the nickname, the best design city in America, uh, from starting with the green parks. Yeah, that's a great story. And it, it just, it makes me think too about, you know, going back to, um, uh, your book and street design and the integration of, of nature, you know, right outside our door and, uh, you know, the tree canopies and things of that nature. Uh, tell us, Victor, why are street trees important? <laughs> well, all right. How much time you got? Street trees are so important. We could talk about it all week. Hey, I, um, I, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I, I am, I am a bit obsessed with street trees. Um, as a topic, you know, the reason for uh, going out and, and working with John to create a book about street design was because we felt, after thinking about it for 25 years, that street design was the one thing we could least afford to get wrong, you know, in, in the making of great cities, the cities that people love. The subtitle of the book is Street Design the secret to great cities and towns. However, street design is also the thing most often gotten wrong in modern times. You know, the inadvertent mistakes or sometimes deliberate mistakes um, and bad habits. And they're made, made collectively. We, we forget how important those are. I remind audiences that the, the, the streets in their town are the biggest thing they own. We own them together. But if they stop and think about all the things they own, you know, they'll, and you ask them to make a list, they'll list their car, their house, their refrigerator, their clothes, their, their iPhone or whatever. Um, and I have to remind them, no, you also own the library, you own the city hall, you own the, the Central Park, you own the town square, you own the streets. And the streets are the biggest thing you own. So we should be very uh, demanding, I think, of our, ourselves and of our local governments and making great streets. And that doesn't happen nearly often enough. So that's really why I got motivated to make the book. Well, the more closely you look at streets, the more obsessed you will become with street trees. Um, and you can summarize it like this. I mean, we've, we, we had the opportunity to go back and visit a neighborhood we had designed in, in Davidson, North Carolina, a few years earlier. And I, there was a lady walking. I, I snapped her picture. She was walking down the sidewalk. And I talked to her. She was a uh, senior citizen. I asked her what was important to her about the neighborhood or why, you know, why she chose this street to walk on. She pointed to her house down the block and she said, look up. You see those trees? Those trees are my lifeline. Those trees are the reason I come out of my house and, uh, and I get my daily exercise. If they weren't there, I'd never walk on this sidewalk. It would be too hot. I'd, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking down the sidewalk because it's, you know, it's not that far from the moving cars and, you know, somebody might, uh, you know, drive, lose control and or not be paying attention and run up on the sidewalk and mow me down. Uh, those street trees make it likely that my neighbors will come out on their porches, which are shaded by the, their, their front stoops, shaded by those trees, and say hello to me as I go by. And she explained it all right there. She, you know, these... The most important green parts, the street trees, uh, were doing so many things at one time. They were changing the behavior, the way we drive, the way we, whether or not we walk. They were changing the climate. They were lowering the air conditioning costs inside the buildings. They were, they were protecting her as she was walking down the sidewalk. They were giving her the visual experience of, of uh, that intimacy or coziness that you feel when you walk down a street that has a beautiful street tree canopy. Um, and so they were holding storm water, they were making oxygen, they were doing so many things at one time. Uh, we need to plant a zillion street trees. 
a bazillion, gazillion street trees in America to replace the ones that were lost in our older parts of town and to deal with the bald and hostile streets in our suburbs. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the the traffic calming aspects that the that the street trees uh, may be able to to provide, and uh, I think it, it actually may... happens two ways, John. I'll tell yeah. you. First, if there are trees in your field of vision while you're motoring, you think about it, and uh, and it will make you slow down. But if you don't think about it, you'll slow down anyway, because just subconsciously you're always aware that there there are these elements of visual friction inside your field of vision, and they're close enough to the street that you wanna be careful, maintain your line, drive in a straight line, follow, stay in your lane, and so on. And immediately your, your foot will hit the accelerator a little less heavily. But the other way that it works, I think, which I think is, um, is probably easy to miss, is that in the absence of the tree, you feel like, well, I can take my eyes off the road. I, don't, I can look down at my phone. I can, I can mess with the radio or, or whatever. And and you'll just again, without even thinking about it, you'll drive a little less carefully. You'll move a little bit about a little bit more in the lane. Uh, so there's a kind of a very subconscious level. There's there's an impact on the way we behave. Now the the second sort of important big way that the trees affect you is is this: if you're deciding which route to take. You can, you can go home this way or that way after a hard day at work. Um, and one of those routes is uh, maybe even a little faster, but uh, stressful and hostile. It's full of more cars and it's, uh, and it's got a lot of lanes and, um, and everything is moving a lot faster and so on. And the, uh, but the alternative route is the one that has a beautiful street tree canopy. Chances are you will, every once in a while at least, Choose the beautiful route, even if it takes you a few minutes longer. It's because you know your mind craves the positive experience you get when you're among nature. There's, um, you know, so Benton Mackay, who was a really influential thinker uh, in the early 20th century, he thought up the idea of the Appalachian Trail. He was, um, he was a landscape observer and a landscape architect. He, he uh, wrote a lot of wise things about cities. And it was one of the reformers who advocated for parks and, and, and regional planning, kind of on a big scale. And Benton Mackay, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he had the idea that to remain truly human, you should have daily access to what he called three elemental landscapes. The first was um, the primeval landscape, he called it. But by that, he meant wilderness, you know, forest or um, open space, park, park space, conservation lands. Uh, but I think he also meant spaces that had been created to give you those same kinds of impressions, like the artificial, uh, let's call it, man-made comp- composition of uh, naturalistic landscapes like we see in Olmsted's Central Park. And then the second landscape he, he recommended we have daily access to was the working landscape. And by that he meant farms and or the working waterfront or uh, the, the places where people make things. And the third of these was the city, the neighborhood. He called it the landscape of, of man. We probably would call it landscape of humankind now. Um, but that's the, that's the city, you know, the, the place where we come into daily interaction with other people. And, uh, and we see all sorts of human creativity continually on display. So his idea was, you're, if you want to be truly human, you need all these. Isn't that just a great thought? Um, so in his love day, it. yeah, no, I this love is, it. <laughs> this will explain how my obsession with streets leads to an obsession with street trees, which leads to an obsession with parks. Um, in his day, reformers were trying to address the public health problems of the industrializing cities, and the you know late nineteenth century industrialized city with people crushing in in huge numbers, whether they were getting off the boat at Ellis Island or they were coming in from the farms and the hinterlands. These were pretty toxic, poisonous places. They were unsanitary. They they were filled with smoke and the chemical uh, effluent pollution uh, involved in um, early industrial production. And you can see that in New York or you can see that in in London uh, or Manchester. It was a 
and eventually a worldwide phenomenon of, of pollution. One we've, we've largely addressed now, at least in the United States, uh, through uh, environmental protection and regulation and better habits. In the meantime, we've we sort of continued to toxify the city with all that chunk that comes out of our tailpipes from our cars. And so that's the new version of the problem, how to make the city less toxic. So back in the day of these reformers, uh, they spoke about how um, uh, people are being systematically, in their views, destroyed uh, by the stress of modern industrial life or by the frenetic pace of the city um, or by the pollution itself. Uh, they were being decreated. And that was a term they used, decreation. And they invented the antidote to that, and th which they called recreation, something we take totally for granted now when we talk about the Parks and Recreation Department. The actual origin of that term was rooted in the same thing as Benton Mackay's elemental landscapes, that uh, we need a central park. We need the greenway and the trail and the tranquility of the Ludlam Trail and so on to recreate ourselves as an antidote to the stress, whether it's experienced at home when you're on Zoom all day long, or it's experienced at the office or experienced in the factory or in traffic. And so um, I feel like the pandemic may have actually given us a chance to get back in touch with our roots as city planners in the way that the modern profession of city planning had its origins in public health. Did you follow that line? Streets, Absol street absolutely. trees, absolutely, yeah. Greenways, start with the green parts, parks, recreation, recreation. It's all one thing, and that's how that's how we design the city we want. Absolutely, this is what I love about having conversations with you, Victor. Is I learn something new every single time, and as somebody who has spent his entire thirty-year-plus career in you know trying to encourage healthy, active behavior, I never knew that about the word recreation. Boom. Mic drop right there. <laughs> that is fantastic. I spent a lot of time in the, in the last few years as a board member of, of two groups. One, our, our local Parks Foundation, the Parks Foundation of Miami-Dade, and also the, the National Recreation and Park Association, which is a kind of a governing body and credentialing body for uh, parks managers and parks and rec directors and uh, people involved in the making of parks and really a leadership group in the parks movement, the modern parks movement, which we have to remind ourselves is really only about 160 years old. Um, so in, in that experience, I'm constantly getting confirmation that uh, the, the key to your city is in the parts that are outside buildings, in the public realm, between buildings, not just the number of square feet you have inside buildings or the land uses that get designated for your buildings on maps or the number of parking spaces. Yeah, the uh, a couple of things, you know, pop into my mind when you were just saying that um, one is your hashtag park life <laughs> that well, you, that, you yeah. frequently sure use. <laughs> yeah. um, live, a, live a park life is a motto of the modern parks movement. And one, yeah, yeah. The Parks no, Foundation of Miami-Dade uses it a lot. Yeah, it's and and it's one of those things that that I think is 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 worth reminding. And in fact, I had Bianca Shoelaker uh, from um, uh, TPL, the, the the Trust for Public Land, on a few episodes ago, and we we right. talked about the Park Score Index mm -hmm. that they they have and and their initiative of the ten minute walk initiative to to ensure right. that every resident in an urbanized area is within a ten minute walk to a park or green space or meaningful open you know open space type of situation or at the very least a, a community garden. So this reminds I urge me everyone that. who uses Twitter and their and among their social media tools to go a search um, ten minute walk. And they'll find the 10 minute walk campaign that the National Recreation and Park Association and the Trust for Public Land and other organizations are collaborating on. City Parks Alliance and other groups also, you know, are reminding mayors and city managers um, that their, their parks movement is incomplete, that it needs their constant nourishment. 
And we really should get to the point where everybody in America is within a few minutes walk of a quality park space because there isn't anybody in America who doesn't deserve that. Um, particularly if you, if you remember Mr. Mackay's admonition that we all need that to remain truly human. And then I talk to people all the time and discover that many of their formative experiences occurred in parks. It may have been an organized sports experience, you know, like uh, playing baseball or something. But for many people, it was just going there and throwing frisbee with the dog, or, uh, or um, strolling through a forested trail with their parents as little kids. But these are the these are the experiences that they will never forget that shape them. And then there are all these health benefits that go beyond getting your ten thousand steps a day, or um, or just breathing some fresh air. All of those are incredibly important. Um, there's there's Research you've probably heard about that says that um, a short amount of time spent among green uh, tree canopy will have as much beneficial effect for people with uh, attention deficit and hyper hyperactivity disorder as medication does. Uh, isn't that amazing? It's very profound. And same thing they found: you know, cortisol levels drop and dopamine levels go up and uh, you know, exposure to parks for a few minutes, even if you're not running up your heart rate, uh, can be as beneficial to lowering your cholesterol as a lot of time spent on a treadmill or on a stationary bike. And that it's so, I think we, whether it's the physical benefits or the mental health benefits, I tend to forget most of our cities have parks or parks departments or rectangles of land called parks or parks districts that were established by previous generations. You know, and then we have some great ones. You know, Chicago, St. Louis, New York, Miami, Los Angeles all have amazing park systems that were established decades and decades ago. Where the, they celebrated the 90th anniversary of the park system in Miami-Dade, which is pretty amazing when you think that 90 years ago, we barely had civilization here. And, uh, and now you know, we're celebrating 90 years of an amazing park system, fourth largest in the country. So because we forget that we inherited these things uh, and we didn't have to go out and make them ourselves or start them from scratch, we forget they're not finished. You know, that there are hundreds of millions of dollars in deferred maintenance in our parks, that there, there are uh, unrealized plans for making parks more accessible. And then biggest of all, there are huge swaths of our region which do not have parks within 10 minute walk of someone's house. And it's one of the great structural inequities and expressions of institutional racism in our country that that's the case. So we really kind of need an, a, in, along with our recommitment to livable cities period, which is embodied by the new urbanism movement and by smart growth. Uh, we also need a recommitment to the great parks movement. Uh, you know, to pick up on what we've inherited and continue the work. Yeah, it, it brings me back to something you said earlier, too, when we were talking about street trees and you had mentioned a, a more pleasurable route, you know, being able to, to head in down that particular street because it is able to help provide some of that revitalization and bring that stress level down and, and that sense of renewal so, that's even more true if you rode your bike instead of driving, by the way. Exactly. So that's where I'm heading with this <laughs> is, is that, you know, when we think about our, our park network and then when we also think of our street network, how do we create more pleasurable routes? How do we create, um, you know, essentially linear parks? How do we create streets that welcome people so that you know we are encouraged to walk and bike and get out of the car uh, there's nothing more depressing in my mind than a, a network of parks that are only accessible by car um talk a little bit about that because i think that that brings it all together we you, you've got your your green space planning and you've got your parks and then we've got our street design and then we've got our active mobility thing let's let's bring them all together well think about Olmsted's example in Buffalo, where he said, don't just take this rectangle and that rectangle and make a park out of each. Design a park system 
and connect them with the great green tree-lined parkways and boulevards or the greenways and trails or both. Um, and you know, his famous emerald necklace for Boston uh, was a, a plan really for cleansing the water that was going to end up in the Charles River um, and make the city a more healthful place uh, to, to live and breathe and drink um, water. And he... And I think so really it's that connectedness that we have to regain. Well, today, a lot of parks departments will, you know, accept a rectangle of land as part of an uh, annexation procedure or a rezoning. And some, you know, they'll put it in their program to upgrade that land and improve the park. Someday in the future, they'll build a ball field or make a trailhead or um, or, or what have you. They encourage a community garden, but they'll have a programming phase, you know, for how to make the park a place. And I, it's so much more than that, that we really need to be thinking of all of our streets as extensions of the green, of that same uh, Olmstead Green Network. And that means planting a lot of street trees that are missing or have been lost to, to blights or disease or storms and that quite, never quite got replaced or got lost to the bulldozers that were widening the roads. If we want to make our streets welcoming places that encourage active mobility, the most important things are uh, really deciding to focus on safety and beauty and the comfort of pedestrians uh, instead of focusing on speed and capacity. The obsession in the 20th century was with speeding the cars up, making it easier to flow, and no matter what the cost, literally no matter what the financial cost, but also no matter what the cost to the other users of the space, like people on two feet or two wheels. And speed over safety translates into you know more than 40,000 people a year dying in traffic, uh, which is ridiculous. And, uh, and cities that are dangerous by design. We've, we, as many of your previous podcast guests have pointed out, we don't don't call them accidents anymore when somebody uh, loses their life, when uh, a motorist runs them over in the, in the crosswalk or um, in, uh, on their bike. Uh, don't call them accidents because it was designed in such a way that made that probable. You know, over-engineered, speed is everything, uh, capacity over all other concerns. Those kinds of streets are deadly and they and we just have to rethink that we have to remake our relationship and we've given given an opportunity to do that lots of reasons why that's true we're rediscovering mixed-use places anyway people want to go to and spend time in the walkable environments um, and they are turned off by the driving only drive everywhere for, for everything environments so our customers, if we will, the citizenry, but also the, uh, the real estate marketplace always leads us in a direction of prioritizing safety and beauty uh, over, over speed and capacity. So that when you do, when you make that shift, when you realize that all of the users of this space are important, and that instead of trying to add something in a kind of perfunctory way at the, in, at the end uh, for pedestrians, we should be starting with the pedestrians and the, and the other non-motorized road users like the folks on bikes. We should be starting with the kind of address we wish to create so that the adjacent um, real estate succeeds, whether it's a street with a row of houses with front porches on them, uh, preferably over, say, garage doors facing the street. Or if it's a place where we're making business addresses, we want the adjacent businesses to thrive, or the companies that would employ people to choose those as their as their roosting place for their business. If we start with the pedestrians and making great addresses, and then we design in uh, adequate accommodations for people who are driving and for trucks and deliveries and fire trucks and so on, then we'll get a great street. If we try to start with the, with the high-speed motoring objectives and, a, and uh, making them happy motoring the only thing that matters and then try to add back pedestrian happiness at the end, 
we find we don't have room. They'll say, well, that's very nice, Mr. Dover, but we don't have room for street trees. And, I'm, and I will say, you made the lanes too wide. You have too many lanes. What do you need a right turn deceleration lane for? You shouldn't be speeding that fast on the street anyway. It's a city. And so, uh, you know, this is the, the kind of perpetual argument that um, John Massengale and I realized um, was going to eventually force us to write a book about street design. <laughs> and so we did. I love it. And uh, one of the things that we've seen in the last, gosh, couple years, I guess it is, is in addition to the 10 minute walk, we have the 15 minute city and, you know, the one minute neighborhood. And so, and you started to mention this, you know, these are meaningful addresses that are within easy walking and biking distance. And then we see uh, you know, some of the advances that we're seeing happening right now in, in Paris. Talk a little bit more about that, because we're really getting into the essence of, of land use. It's just a rebalancing. Uh, things get out of balance, and then you compensate, and you bring them back to equal, reasonable equilibrium. And uh, so the Parisian experiment with, um, with de-emphasizing the car that's just returning Paris to being Paris after Paris was allowed to get out of balance. And some of its wider, straighter thoroughfares were made into places that, um, while still photogenic, are a bit exhausting. Um, literally exhausting because of the stress that comes with the noise and the, the violence of fast-moving cars, but also all that exhaust coming out of the tailpipes of the, of the cars. So I think what we really see going on with the 15-minute city experiment, it's a little bit like the 24-hour city idea that 20 years ago, uh, is nothing um, new. It's actually just restoring traditional human settlements to the, one of their basic patterns, which is we, like, we crave mixed-use places. We crave the convenience that comes from being able to walk down the street to a corner cafe or a place that's not ho home or work, but one of those uh, so-called third places. We crave people watching. You know, it's it's normal human activity. It, it turned into one you had to drive to a mall to do at the food court, but it was still, um, people watching is, was always a normal and natural stimulating human activity. So I don't think the, the one-minute neighborhood or the 15-minute city or the 24-hour city are... Um, are uh, breakthroughs. I think that they are just restorations of something that was always true for about 3,500 years of human experience in city building. I mean, we take them as the special things that they are now when those initiatives are undertaken because they stand out in a, in a civilization full of scarcity where we might have all sorts of products and things, but we don't have enough of those livable places. Now, the neuroscientists have been talking about this for a while too. Um, and I would say our, our um, parallel creatives in the world of marketing and advertising are super alert to this and have been all along. They knew how to advertise cars and sprawl uh, to make it seem really sexy and attractive and make people want it. Uh, you know, to get a kind of hormone release from just seeing an automobile ad with a beautifully photographed, glossy image of the curves of a 1950s car with its with its fins and its you know streamlined um, futuristic shape. That this kind of um, stimuli that we respond to in advertising. It's it's um, it's something that the advertising folks have known how to manipulate for a long time. As it turns out, the traditional cities, the restored historic districts, the great main streets, the town square, with Bryant Park, uh, these are places where you get that same sort of good feeling and stimulation just from being there. And if we make more of those and make them accessible to more people, then, uh, then we're just selling the real thing instead of um, the mere hormonal response or dopamine release. I, so there's a, another active towns aspect and, and a healthy living aspect to this. 
I'm sure you've seen the research that shows longevity has increased um, in livable communities. And the, the scientists who studied huge cohorts of people, you know, thousands and thousands of people asking them all kinds of questions about their lives, and then went back 10 years later to see who was still breathing, found a really strong correlation um, between the kind of place they lived in and uh, the likelihood that they were still still alive. And some of that is some of the things on their top 10 list of what made a difference between living another decade or not are kind of predictable. Did they take their blood pressure medicines if they were on it? Did they stop smoking? Did they drink less? Um, you know, th that sort of thing. But the big, and, and, or did they get their exercise, which is certainly our, our active towns, always our active towns topic. But the top factors, number two and number one, are really different and stand out. Number two was a strong uh, social network that they had a, uh, a number of people in friends and family with whom they were in regular contact. And uh, that was true of the people who were living longer and happier and healthier lives, and less true of those who weren't. And then the number one, this is really interesting, daily interaction with others. Not necessarily people they know. You know, it could be just the barista who makes their coffee at the coffee shop down the, on the corner. Not somebody, they might know the person's name from their name badge. They say good morning. Uh, and and you say good morning back. And that little interaction was the top number one correlation to longevity and, and uh, happy, healthy, healthy lives. Happy, healthy lives. So I, to me, that research tells me we have to design more of these great traditional neighborhoods that are places where people like to be. Um, it's a public health imperative. Yeah, I hear you. And the thought that comes to mind is really the fact that one of the great things about creating walkable, bikeable communities is that it helps encourage people to get those lower level amounts of physical activity in. It's, it, you know, it's not necessarily a workout. It's not exercise. It is like encouraging people just to be able to do that. And we know through, um, really studying, uh, you know, these various societies where we see lots of people out in active mobility, they're walking and they're biking, they're getting places like in the Netherlands, like in Copenhagen, we're seeing all these little micro interactions that are happening. And so I think it's just what, what you're getting to there is those daily interactions, it might be micro interactions. Um, what I love about shared space and um, and, and like really kind of dynamic places where you're able to like just through very, very short little uh, body movements and interactions, you can make your way you know, through a, a, a chaotic shared space like a, a roundabout or, or, or a, a crowded. Um, it's all about eye contact. Yes, exactly. It's eye contact, but it's also what what seems very very powerful here is now we're seeing that those little interactions are also incredibly healthful and powerful good stuff absolutely i i do think that we have to work on reducing the stress associated with taking it doing the, the simple thing of taking a bike ride um and you know i'm a i'm a confident cyclist i ride all the time and and you know at, I learned, you know, sort of ride in traffic and and all that. But most most people are not in that are not in that way of thinking or used to that at all. And they're they're unlikely to ride because they don't have a low stress alternative. And we have to stop and differentiate for a bit between the experience of walking, this incredibly efficient activity we do, um, and and the experience of biking you know as a lifelong exerciser john you know when you're out swimming um, or running there's a kind of rhythmic breathing to it and you're you know you find a nice uh, elevated cardiovascular but a steady state um, it can actually be remarkably refreshing and calming even if you're 
in the in the zone and working you know your cardiovascular system. And if you're a good swimmer, you're a confident swimmer, you're probably not going to drown. If you're um, confident at walking and, and running, um, you might occasionally stumble, but very seldom, right? Most of the time, you're not going to fall down. You're going to do fine. And you don't have to think about it very much. Um, but in the city, for most cyclists, the experience is anything but that. For most people on the you know holding the handlebars, they have a running inner narrative in their head that um, is all about staying safe because now they're hurtling down the road in a little bit faster way. And they may just be taking a relaxed, upright, you know, Dutch bike kind of ride um, at slow speeds. Or they might be, you know, in the drops like a racing uh, a fitness cyclist, you know, clipped into the pedals and all that stuff and really hammering it. Either way, they're going a lot faster than they were if they were walking or even running. And as a result, they know that if something goes wrong, it can, the, you know, they'll hit the pavement with a lot more violence. And so what's that inner narrative? You're, you're, as you're pedaling along, you think um, everything you see becomes a potential obstacle. And you know what they are. Gravel, glass, dog, leash, stop sign, red light, red tail light, signal, truck. Hole, glass, you know, so this one after another, you're, you're looking at all the things. And, you know, even if you're in a bike lane, it, it could be uh, tree limbs that have fallen in it or uh, chances are there's a UPS truck or an Amazon delivery truck parked in your bike lane. Um, you're going to have to go around. And so we're the inner voice uh, to you as you're piloting a bicycle uh, is trying to keep you safe, but the experience can be unduly stressful. And I think uh, it's really great that these days bike planners are talking about level of stress analysis as the, the cycling parallel to the, the dumb old discredited level of service analysis traffic engineers are doing for cars. But seeing how we can lower the stress, more protected places to, to bike, more separation, where it's appropriate or shared space that causes the, the slow operation of the motor vehicles. So as we're interacting with them, there's just feels less risk, less danger and risk. And also, you know, that the people who are in charge of maintaining the public realm are caring as much about the bike lane as they are about the car lane. Uh, in many cities where we work, there's a bike lane right there uh, next to the car lane or even separated by some stripes of paint or some ugly white plastic sticks or even a little green. Um, chances are they run a street sweeper right down the car lane and they clean it up in the middle of the night, every few times a week. And they just push all of the debris, the gravel, the stuff that fell off the back of a produce truck or whatever, uh, over into the bike lane and leave it there. And so uh, we have to kind of rethink and reform our public works departments and the people who are maintaining our streets to say, hey, if you're going to pl uh, plow the snow off of the lane to get the cars moving, plow the bike lane too. Don't pile the snow in the bike lane. Uh, if you're going to enforce, uh, you know, where it is and isn't allowed to park or um, or, uh, or double park, uh, teach that Amazon driver the bike lane is not the place they're supposed to block. And um, and let's sweep, let's sweep the glass, the broken glass, out of the bike lane too, not just out of the out of the car lane. Yeah, it, that really resonates with me in the sense that uh, I've kind of made it my own personal mission to reduce my stress whenever I get on the bike, and which is almost every single day. I'll I'll jump on my uh, my bike to either ride to the trailhead to go for a run in in the the, the Barton Creek Greenbelt or uh, to the grocery store, and so you know I throw my panniers on the back of of the bike and and head out. I can't even remember like the last. Sounds like civilization, John. I know, isn't it? It's, it's well, just we're, awesome. so so. <laughs> let's let's address that. Yeah, we're we're extremely privileged that we happen to live in an area where we can get to meaningful destinations um, by either walking or biking. Um, for the most part, the car sits in the driveway and and doesn't move. Um, and so, yes, we have that level of privilege that we're able to to live in this manner and be living a, a car light lifestyle. Um, 
But in addition to that, I also have adjusted my own behavior. But, by the way, why should that just be for the lucky people? Like, like you get exactly. to live in a lucky it neighborhood it, it, it sh- in it Austin. Shouldn't. That should be normal. Absolutely. You, you get 100% uh, agreement with me as well. Um, but one of the Liz things... Mool helped pen something she called the Pedestrian Bill of Rights. Yeah. I, of course, I would expand to include the other non-motorized users like people on bikes. Yep. But I think uh, everything you just described should be normal. Yes. And it should be the exception that people have to live a completely car dependent lifestyle if that's what they choose rather than the rule. That's a whole bunch of active towns right there. <laughs> so one of the things that I've really done with my own behavior is trying to uh, to relax. And, you know, I, I now view my bike as simply pedestrian plus. Mm. I do not travel at high speeds. I do not wear a helmet. And I choose routes that I know are going to be, you know, very comfortable routes for me to go. And as it turns out, I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of my neighbors that are out there doing the same. They're sharing sure. street space. They're walking their dogs. Maybe we don't, more now than at any time in recent memory. Exactly. And we don't have sidewalks in our neighborhood. So that's where the people are occupying is the streets. And even though the, the streets, you know, may have a 25 mile per hour sign on them, some of them are even 30 mile per hour signs. Uh, what has happened over the last, you know, 18 to 24 months now is we've seen a, a calming effect. And that brings us right back to where we were before with traffic calming um, and how important that is. Because you, you started to talk about the, 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 the level of violence that is out there, the hostile environment of our streets and and that's just you know that's a waste if we walk outside our door we walk outside of our from our home or our office and the environment that we have is a hostile noisy polluting place there's a lot there i i I really relate to everything you're describing um Several things came to mind. When a few years ago, uh, my well, quite a few years ago now, my wife said, you know, instead of just riding your bike on the weekend to get your heart rate up and have fun with your buddies, you should ride your bike to work. You know, we don't live that far from work. You should ride your bike. And I kind of thought, well, I guess that does make sense. I've been thinking about that for a long time. This was years and years ago. But um, so I decided to ride my bike to work. And the first day I rode to work, I you know, I just defaulted into all those same habits. I would, I would apply if I were in the weekend, you know, biking for fitness. And uh, so I started seeing how fast I could go. Like, how fast can I get to work? And pedaling as hard as I could. How how fast can I make this thing go, even at rush hour? And um, get, get my heart rate up, like as if I was exercising. Um, and of course, I arrived at work, but I was sweaty and <laughs> winded and. Uh, and I felt a sense of accomplishment at the same time. I thought, I think I might have done this wrong. And so on the way home, I said, okay, I'm going to try this differently. I'm just going to ride no harder and faster than, or work no harder uh, than if I were walking. But except that I'm on my bike, so I'm going to this great breeze of my own making. This, uh, and that's, that's, that became my habit for my, for my bike commute to work is that I just think of it as walking, but a little faster. You called it pedestrian plus. And that's when my bike suddenly changed from being a, uh, a sports toy to being uh, my horizontal elevator. It's my elevator that takes me to the metro station or takes me to the office uh, or to the corner store, and, and I can get there a little faster than if I walked. But it takes me to, uh, to transit. So in a way... Once you adopt this attitude toward the toward the bike, that it's your solution to the first and last mile from transit, uh, it becomes like an, an extender uh, for the effectiveness of your local transit system. Because when I realized I could combine the bike and the bus or the bike and the train, suddenly region you know, destinations all over the region were accessible to me in a way that I hadn't really realized before. And uh, around that time, the rules were all relaxing. People were becoming more accustomed to seeing cyclists in Miami-Dade. Um, I argued that we're still an endangered species, but we're increasing in number all the time. Uh, th- there's an old joke that 
in Miami-Dade, we constantly get um, written up in the national media for having that year the fastest growing percentage of daily bike commuters, which is pretty amazing, right? When you think about it, hey, look at us, we're number one. We have the fastest growing percentage. Of course, if you start with a sufficiently small number, then it doesn't take that many additional people to, to translate statistically to a, fast, to a faster growing percentage. But there are more of us. And so the others out there, and like including those that are driving, are a little more accustomed to seeing us in the space. And they are beginning to behave like they, they grudgingly or willingly accept us in the space. I think that's all improving. But the bike is like the horizontal elevator now. I love it. The Victor powered people mover. I like that. So, and, and that's where the high comfort network is, is so incredibly important because if we want to, you know, see more people out riding, uh, more people taking advantage of active mobility, it has to tr feel truly, truly comfortable. And, uh, you know, and, and, and again, this has been proven over and over again, that if you do that, if it's authentically pleasurable and comfortable, uh, humans are pragmatic and they're mm -hmm. going to take advantage of that, especially if we've got the, the land use right and meaningful destinations are within striking distance. Yeah. Gabe Klein, uh, who's a brilliant thinker about all things transportation and, and cities, um, said something I think is absolutely right. He said, people use the infrastructure that you build. So if you build highways and freeways and wide, fast roads and a bunch of parking spaces, then people drive. But if you build bike lanes and transit, then people use bike lanes and transit and, so and sidewalks and so on. And that is such a simple idea, but it is it crystallizes what we need to go do as a nation or a planet uh, in the coming decades. Uh, we need to build the infrastructure uh, so that people can feel natural doing things that are part of the solution rather than more of the problem. Whether the problem is health related or the problem is the health of the planet, uh, we need to make it easy and pleasurable to do those, those uh, green mobility solutions. Absolutely. Very wise words, Gabe. <laughs> hey, Victor, um, to close us out, what are you most excited about right now in 2021? Oh, that's, that's you know, that asking me which project I'm the most excited about is like asking which of my children do I love the most. I mean, we love them all. Uh, they're all great things to do. But I'm, I'm actually excited about seeing the integration of the really small moves with the big ones. We're now finally, I think, getting to a point, not just in our practice, but in a lot of comparable practices around the country, where we can see an integrated... Um, set of solutions that are connected to each other across scale. So the, the idea of the future of the region can be expressed in the design of a single neighborhood or a single street corridor or, um, or a tiny little infill development. And so in, you know, in our office these days where we're working on implementing at different scales the idea of, of livable, walkable urbanism, um, we're working right now on a, a pocket neighborhood, an idea that you interviewed Ross Chapin about uh, a few months ago. Uh, Ross is responsible for being the, the father of the modern revival of the cottage court and pocket neighborhood, as he's, as he's termed it. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the most exciting projects we have on the board is also one of the smallest because it involves uh, small-scale, incremental, and gradual change rather than uh, abrupt gigantic change in most towns you know the city council or the planning board is confronted with big decisions about gigantic and abrupt rapid change should we approve this you know thousand acre subdivision should we approve this million square feet of of uh, amazon distribution facility or something but you know kind of cataclysmic decisions often Decisions for which the newly elected elected officials or the, um, say, the, the volunteer planning board members or what have you have no training for and no experience in. And they're going to, they know these are forever decisions, big, long lasting decisions that will have repercussions for centuries. Uh, so I'm actually excited about seeing small things 
you know, small the next smallest increment of change, as our incremental incremental development alliance friends call it. Uh, so the pocket neighborhood that that uh, Ross has popularized, or uh, the improvement one street at a time, the idea of the small and local development, uh, building capacity for a thousand small developers instead of just one big corporate one. I'm, I think that's our new version, our 21st century of small is beautiful. I love it. Doing what you can at that, you know, microscopic level. It's not even just the neighborhood level. It, it, it's starting to get into those sure. those pocket sizes of, of being able to to do it. And if you're taking things off in, in smaller chunks, then maybe we're just needing to, you know, take down some of the barriers that are in place, you know, whether they're policies or, or things that are uh, in, codified in codes to be able to make it easier to be able to do the right thing, you know, and, and be able to bring a little bit more life to that block level. Well, instead of the built environment being something that happens to us that we just accept, uh, maybe maybe grudgingly, and something that we more or less tolerate, in the same way that you know Americans got accustomed to to kind of tolerating the burger that was made at the at the corporate chain burger joint, we need to be a little more demanding and also more involved in it. Like the the built environment needs to be a product that we're all working on, not just a few anonymous corporations or uh, real estate trusts or fat cat developers from far away. If if we can uh, remove those barriers, as you call them, so a whole lot more people can get involved, that means the result will be more just, it'll be more equitable, it'll be more lasting in its positive economics of job creation and real estate value creation. Uh, and it'll be better for the planet, and it'll be a lot more fun, and it'll be a lot more beautiful. So uh, I think uh, I am most excited about small incremental change. Fantastic. Any final thoughts on pearls of wisdom for dealing with uh, the NIMBYs that are out there and resistance to change to the status quo? Well, I'm glad you asked about that. I, actually, my colleague, Jason King, who's a principal here in our office, um, just wrote a book called The Climate Planner. And it's uh, about it, our experiences uh, working on plans that in one way or another are essentially climate ad adaptation plans, or adaptation plans for all the whole suite of 20th century problems, including climate change and sea level rise and so on. Um, and uh, he deals in, in some exquisite detail about well, what works and what doesn't in interacting with uh, a skeptical public. So I encourage everybody to go check out Jason King's book, uh, The Climate Planner. You know, what works most is to tap into people's own experiences and have them come to the realizations themselves, not to force feed, feed it to them. In, uh, you know, in planning, you know, you, you you study a lot, you travel a lot, you gather up all this technical expertise and mastery and all that stuff. But the dirty little secret of city planning is that people don't like being told what to do. <laughs> Which is what city planning sounds like, you know, saying the street goes this way and the zoning code says do this thing and what have you. So, but people don't like being told what to do. They like coming to the conclusion on their own that uh, this thing or that thing is the right thing to do. So how do you do it? with um, not in my backyard skeptics who are not so sure about whether they want commercial activity near their home or they want to or not so sure whether accessory dwelling units would be okay um, you know, on the lots in the neighborhood in, in their neighborhood and I think the answer is you try to get them to go experience it with themselves or remind them that they might have experienced it themselves when they went on vacation um, tends to be pretty good that if they're somebody with enough time on their hands to make time for a city council meeting or a planning board hearing, they've all, they've also traveled and they've been to Charleston and Savannah and uh, they've been to San Francisco and they've, they've uh, and, and they've you know they've, they've sensed Old Town Alexandria if they or they even know what Seinfeld's apartment looked like just because they saw it on television. So you can plug into their experiences of real places, then it all sounds a lot less threatening. Um, the turns out the 
place they had the, all those great memories or they took those great uh, family photographs or cherished Instagram memories were in places where the built environment was configured exactly the way we're suggesting. Like those thousands of years of human experience in city building, it's configured with walkable streets and configured with uh, beauty first and with street-oriented architecture. And probably things were a little closer together, maybe even touching each other. Uh, that is, those things like buildings. And that, that um, if you can make that connection, then you're a whole lot more likely to have them arrive at the conclusion that we might actually be able to build our way out of some of our problems, that change and growth could make things better rather than worse. And that's the key to arresting NIMBYism. If we, if we can restore confidence in growth and change, instead of leaving people under their default assumptions that growth and change makes things worse rather than better. And they are conditioned to believe that's true because so much of what they live through and is all around them is built evidence supporting the idea of that conditioning, that, that development made things worse. Um, it's important for the planners and the architects and the urban designers and mayors and all, the, and all the, those and those kinds of jobs that we recover our credibility. I think it's even more important that the developers do so. And, you know, the, um, there is a, an assumption among the not in my backyard contingent that developers are the bad guys and bad gals uh, who are the problem. And, um, and certainly it's true in some cases, but, the, but most of the time, developers are just doing what they can. Um, an old friend once said, developers do the deals they can actually do. And that might be the one that complies with a whole lot of really dumb land development regulation, um, zoning and minimum parking requirements and deep setbacks and um, the separation of land uses and things. They're, they're building it that way because to do so otherwise requires mounting a political campaign and getting special permission. So if you want developers to recover their good reputations, you have to give them permission to do the right thing and let them make money doing it. I often remind people that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were real estate developers. So we, we need to find a, a beloved uh, character like uh, some of our founding father, fathers there that were, have ties to transportation and active mobility. <laughs> because when we look at the status quo resistance to uh, changing parking and changing travel lanes, you'd, you'd think that we were, you know, destroying people's lives and livelihoods. But again, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's change and, and it's, it's uncomfortable and, and, uh, it's fear inducing. And once you get the fear inducing aspect of it, you get the fear mongering going. So. Hey, LeBron James rides a bike. There you go. Le Le LeBron is cool and he rides a bike. <laughs> well, and I guess that I, that's a good point. So it, it really is a matter of, you know, normalizing this. I mean, that's sort of fetishizing it of, you know, somebody famous is doing it. But what we were talking about earlier is just making it normal that you would walk to a grocery store or that you would ride your bike to school or to work or a grocery store or to see a friend you know it should not be as you mentioned earlier this should not be something that's extraordinary this should be something that you know we can do quite easily and comfortably and safely victor it's always such a pleasure to chat with you thank you so very much i i so value our friendship and the ability to to chat with you and uh, and and be able to get you once again on the active towns podcast thank you so much thank you john Thank you also very much for tuning in to episode number 96 of the Active Towns podcast. I really hope you found my chat with Victor informative and entertaining. I know I always learn something new every time I speak with him. To learn more about his firm, Dover Cole and Partners Town Planning, and to access some of the amazing visuals and resources he sent my way, be sure to check out the links in the show notes and more importantly, on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. 
Well, that's all for this week's episode. But first, a final weekly reminder and request to help me grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word, and subscribing. Thank you all so much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.